Hello, Walk Jog Run. This is Angel Russell, and today we are speaking with Fiona Oaks, a.k.a. the Queen of the Extreme. Now, Fiona has won the women's race and set a new course record for the North Pole Marathon. So congratulations, Fiona, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Everyone wants to know, can you set the scene for us on what it was like running this marathon? It was um, incredible. It was absolutely awesome. Um, I'd go so far as to say it was a life-changing experience. Um, it really was um, not just a marathon, it was an, an adventure of a lifetime. Um, it was brutal, the conditions were brutal. Um, it was just spectacular. Um, just every kind of emotion kind of went through my body when I was actually doing it. Kind of fear, excitement, fatigue, everything you get in a marathon compounded by about a hundred times, you know. It was yeah. amazing. I also heard that it was the most extreme weather that they've had in the last few years. So did you suffer any injuries? Did you sink into the snow at all while you were running? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the only, I was very, very lucky. I mean, I was um, actually sponsored by um, a clothing company that supply clothing for those conditions, UVU. Um, and I, I was very, very fortunate in that I didn't really suffer any um, consequences of the, the cold. At one point, I did think I was getting frostbite in my big toe on my right foot. Um, but fortunately, I think because I could keep my pace very even, I didn't slow. And so I didn't kind of um, get cold, you know, start to get cold. If you start to slow down in those conditions, you can get hypothermia. Um, because obviously your body, your temperature co it, it cools down and then, you know, you could, that can be a problem. But because I decided that I was going to meet my effort very, very carefully and start and finish at the same pace, if I could, um, I think I, you know, I, I managed to come through it without the kind of, you know, frostbite or, you know, hypothermia or, you know, the problems that, you know, can be attached with running in those conditions. It was apparently minus 30 or, or below, some people were saying, but um, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did see one or two people with the, you know, kind of real problems with their face and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, because it, everything just froze. I mean, it, I can't, I cannot begin to tell you how quickly things freeze at those, in those conditions. I mean, one guy said that he'd stopped for a toilet break on the course, and when he actually went to start running again, his clothes had frozen him into kind of a um, ice suit of armour, and he couldn't make himself move again. So it really was quite, you know, it was something I wasn't really prepared for. I've never been in that kind of cold before, and I, I really wasn't kind of, I didn't really understand how... Um, immediate the consequences can be and how how devastating it is you know it really is quite awesome you know you really do learn a lesson that mother nature is the uh, you know the queen of the extreme kind of thing not me <laughs> you actually also ran in the desert right in the savannah desert for another marathon no i did the marathon de sable the seven day desert stage race the year before um but if you're going to ask which one is the most difficult to cope with i would have to say the cold Definitely the cold. Yeah. It, it just made me realize that in, 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 the, um, in the hot weather, you, if you get it wrong kind of thing, you don't suffer the consequences so immediately. I mean, for instance, in, at the North Pole, if you take your hand out of your glove within 30 seconds, you're really going to be in trouble. In fact, after the race, they choppered, the Russian guys choppered us to the actual North Pole. Um, and when we arrived there, it was so cold, nobody actually wanted to get out of the chopper to, t to take <laughs> photographs. I mean, it was like, we're at the North Pole now, we're in a helicopter, this is never going to happen again. And it, it was so brutal that we didn't want to get out. I mean, we did eventually, and then it was like, you know, trying to bribe people, you know, will you take your glove off to take a photograph of me if I do one <laughs> a few times? Because it was like, literally, it was, it was awesome, it was extreme, and of course... I was tired after the race, you know, I'd just run a marathon, I'd been on my feet for just under five hours, so I, you know, when you kind of energy resources are de depleted, you do feel it a bit more, um, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it's very difficult, you've really got to manage your effort, and you've really, it's a logistical nightmare running in those conditions, you can get away with a lot more in the desert for a lot longer.
how do you train for these marathons, these extreme marathons, since you don't have that kind of weather to work with? So how do you know to train your body for this? You really don't. I mean, you, you can, all you can do is the best and work with what you've got. You cannot simulate. I mean, I, I, I had heard that some people had had a, a treadmill set up in an industrial freezer so that they could run and, you know, kind of simulate the conditions. Mm-hmm. I, I can't do anything like that. I mean, you know, the only thing I could do was, like, literally pick the worst weather that you would never want to go out running in and think, right, I better go out in this because it's not going to be, you know, this is going to be nothing compared to what I'm going to get at the North Pole. I did take to running in the middle of the night as well. When I was training for the Marathon de Sable, I couldn't fit the training in in the day because of the animals in the sanctuary. So I actually started to go out in the middle of the night with a head torch. So I'd set off about midnight and, you know, get back in the early hours of the morning. And that's when it's at the coldest part of the day, you know, in the winter time. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I think it gets you used to um, the mental side of it, um, the bleakness. I mean, you are on your own out there. Yes, it's light. We, we, we actually started running at 20 to 1 in the morning, um, but it's 24-hour daylight. But there is, you've got to be prepared for the fact that you're going to be on your own. Um, and it's going to be lonely, and you've got to be able to manage your own thoughts and get yourself through the bad, you know, times on your own. There's no one to chat mm-hmm. to. There's no one to run with. Another thing is you literally, you cannot carry anything with you. You cannot carry, obviously, a drink. You cannot carry any um, fuel bars or anything like that because they just freeze. In fact, I had a couple of, um, you know, boiled sweets, hard you know, sweets to suck in my pocket. And at one point I thought, oh, you know, I'll, I fell and I hurt my thumb very, very badly and it was in a lot of pain. And I thought, I'll try sucking a boiled sweet to actually take my mind away from the, the amount of pain I'm in. And when I went to find it in my pocket, I couldn't because it had disintegrated in the cold. It was so cold, it had just crumbled and gone to nothing. How many miles do you run a week? And how do you get yourself to be determined to run that much? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, the motivation can be a problem because I don't actually run with a club. I don't have a training partner. All my training I do alone. And I do my speed work on a treadmill. I don't have access to a track or a training group or anything like that. Mm. So motivating yourself can be a problem. But as I've gone along from like 2001 or whenever I started, you know, doing marathons, I've realized um, by trial and error what you need to do to run a good marathon and um, I just know that if I want to be on the start line in good shape I have got to do the miles and I don't want to be on the start line of a marathon in anything but good shape so I can kind of use that to 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 make myself go out the door and run Um, regarding the amount of training if I'm training for a straightforward marathon in which I want a good time I will do about between 80 possibly 100 mile a week when I was training for Marathon de Sable or the North Pole Marathon, I, my, my heaviest week was 150 mile. Wow. So I have to ask you then, I know you are a vegan runner. So do you have any tips for people that are vegan and vegetarian? And has it affected at all how you, know, you prepare for these races? Um, it's hard for me to say because I've been vegan since I was six years old. Um, so I, I've never done it not on a vegan diet. I've never run not on a vegan diet. Mm-hmm. I think I think a lot of people get kind of hung up. As long as you've got a balanced diet, any, I think any diet can be healthy or unhealthy kind of thing. And as long as you balance your diet and listen to your body, I mean, I, I, I really do emphasize that with whatever diet you're on. If you might see that, you know, uh, Meb Keflagiti, you know, runs on this particular, you know, dietary requirement, but it's not, not, not forced to be the same for you. Everybody is so different in what they need. I don't actually need an awful lot of calories a day. People think, oh, you know, because I'm up at 3.30 a.m. and I've got, like, all the animals and I'm a retained firefighter and I run all these miles, I'm going to, like, need loads and loads of calories or I eat, like, 8,000 calories a day or something. (laughs) I don't. I don't need that much. And I think, you know, I can listen to my body and I I know what I need. I know what I need to do. Um, And I've learned, you know, to actually you know understand the signs that my body is telling me if I, if I don't think I'm getting enough or you know if I think I'm probably overeating even then you know I'm carrying a bit too much weight or whatever I, I can li- I li- listen to that I mean the one thing that I do uh probably the tip that you know if you want a tip for, regarding food that I find very useful 
I eat a lot of Siberian pine nuts. Siberian pine nuts? Yeah. My friend gets them for me. She's in Russia and she sends them over and I do eat a lot of them. And apparently I've, I've always had them for about, since I first went to Russia and we set the sanctuary up there, I've probably about 13 years she gave me these pine nuts and said you must eat these these are really good good for you and I, I stuck to what she said and um yeah they've really done me good service in fact when I went to the desert and that's a self-sufficiency race for seven days you've got to carry everything you're going to need I only took Siberian pine nuts and um a few flapjack bars and that's all I had over the week and uh, yeah I got through it pretty well so the secret is Siberian pine nuts <laughs> that's uh, yeah so what is your all-time favorite pre-meal for each race day? Um, I think it would have to be, um, it's, I'm quite plain in my dietary um, requirements. I like kind of plain food, plenty of fresh vegetables, asparagus, rice, pine nuts <laughs> from Siberia, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and probably just a little bit of, you know, like tomato on basil sauce or something on top. Um, that would be... A, you know, my pre-race meal. Um, I'm, I'm more after my post-race meal because I enjoy it a bit more. The pre-race meal, I'm a bit worked up about, you know, so to speak. I, I tend to think, you know, I usually get really, really kind of nervous before a race. Have I done everything? You know, is everything going to go right mm. on the day? You know, it's like, it's like um, kind of really, you know, I do get kind of freaked out. So I don't really enjoy much before the race. But after the, after the race, yeah, I can sit down and think, yeah, I've earned this meal. <laughs> so, you know, I actually read that at 14 years old, you had a very serious knee replacement. And that resulted in you wearing crutches for years. And I'm just curious, you know, does that still affect you today? Oh, gosh, yeah. But, I mean, people actually know. When, I, when I'm running, if they couldn't see my head or, the, you know, the upper part of my body, they would know it was me running because I've got such a strange style because of this right knee problem. My right knee is covered in scars, and it is still very painful when I run on it, especially towards the latter end of a race. In fact, funnily enough, I've found the longer distance races easier for my knee because it's less impact. Some of the marathons I've run, I've been in such pain when I finished. I wouldn't even want anybody to know from my from this knee injury. I always um, start a race worried that it's going to kick in and really, really cause me problems. And people do say, you know, you never want to stand on the start line of a marathon knowing you're nursing an injury. And I have started every marathon I've ever run knowing I'm not just nursing an injury but a big disability and that's a big ask because you know I've been on the elite lines with like Harley Gabristolassi I mean I've run with top runners in top races you know like I've got an eighth place in Amsterdam and 17th in Berlin and stuff and I've I've literally known that not only am I not as good as them I've got this major major problem to deal with as well you know in that I, I really do hope and pray that my knee does not caused me problems in fact when I finished Amsterdam in 2005 um, it was partially dislocated by the finish of the race I had to go to hospital it was in a, oh. it was in a real problem state um, but you know you come to terms with it if I want to run I've got to be prepared to put up with it I and mean, it does make me stronger in some ways because when I ran Marathon de Sable last year the week before the race I fractured two toes and I had to make my decision of what, whether I was going to go to the Sahara Desert and try and tackle seven days of running with at least a marathon a day with two fractured toes. And I decided that I would do it because I was used to running with pain. I'm, I'm used to kind of coping with things, blacking it out of my mind. So I thought, you know, I've got to go and I've got to try and do it. And I did, I did finish and on the last two stages when I actually got things sorted out. I got top 20 places. So, you know... Um, it, it, I think it's made me a stronger person. I'm not going to moan about the fact that I've got this injury and I, uh, I, you know, I've got a disadvantage. I never make excuses. I don't really talk about my knee injury very much because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm starting on the start line. Uh, I'm not looking for excuses in my performance. I'm just looking at the best I can do with what God's given me kind of thing and uh, or taken away from me kind of thing. So I, I, I'm not looking to, um, you know, make apologies for the fact that I'm not as good as, other runners or you know or you know if I'm better than another runner it's just the way I am and what I have to deal with you actually also have another race coming up in October correct I have actually quite a lot of races coming up the actual Antarctic race that I'm doing is in November that's the um, similar race to the North Pole race but it's at the Antarctic but in the meantime um, I'm doing a world record for the fastest woman to run a marathon on every continent 
plus the polar ice cap. Um, and that will finish with the Antarctic race in November. So um, I'm actually starting that on Sunday. I'm running a marathon on Sunday. Then I'm going to Adelaide two weeks later, um, Casablanca, um, Omsk, and then I'm doing um, a marathon in Texas, in Chile, and then in Antarctica. So and then that will be a world record for the fastest woman to run a marathon yeah, on every continent plus the polar ice cap. So that's your main big goal for right now is to run on all the continents. Yeah, in a, in, in in you know in a in a certain time frame between the um, North Pole and Antarctic marathon, there'll be um, you know six other continents, and then hopefully I'll finish there with the with a world record, and then back in then in April next year I'm going back to the Sahara Desert and and do the Marathon de Sable again. So besides you know being an extraordinary runner, what do you do like on your free time? Uh, I don't really get too much free time because I um I run an animal sanctuary. We've got 400 rescued animals, and um, that's pretty much my life. I mean, I my running is very secondary to the sanctuary. I do all that on my own in the week. Um, I get up at 3:30 in the morning, and I'll probably work through till pretty much eight or nine at night every day, seven days a week. Never have a holiday. Don't have any staff, and my partner goes to work, he works, funny enough, he works in an American bank, not in America, in London, to pay for it. Um, and um, he's here at weekends, but not very much in the week. So I, I do that. And I'm also um retained fire crew. So I'm a firefighter as well. You sound like one very busy lady. <laughs> yeah, I am a bit. Yeah, I am. I'm quite. But the thing is, I don't know if you know what I mean, but I, I actually find it easier to be busy than not mm-hmm. to be busy. To keep going, I actually get problems when I slow down. So I, I prefer to just keep my routine, my regime, and, and stick to what I know because I've been doing it for so long that I know I can do it and I know how I work and how I function. And um, so, yeah, it, it, I am very busy, but I, it's, it's, I, I run for different reasons to most people. I certainly don't run because I think I'm good at running because I don't think I'm good at running. I'm certainly not built for the, for the marathons and I don't, consider myself to have any talent I've just got a lot of determination um I think if you looked at me you'd think oh she's very if she ran I would say she probably ran 400 meters because I'm very big upper body I'm very powerfully built um I'm, I'm not massive obviously but I am a, a bigger than your average marathon runner um just powerfully built I'm kind of solid muscle and I don't um I wouldn't necessarily say that if you looked at me, you'd think she's run 238 in a marathon. Because, uh, I don't know however I did that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've run, I've looked, you know, most marathons that I run, unless they're kind of endurance off-road trail races, I run in under three hours. And um, But I don't look like I'm built for it. But I've just worked very, very hard to be able to get to the standard. It's just about uh, people say, I mean, I did a magazine article, uh, and, and I think she wanted me to t- say, what is this? tip that you can give people to make them run quicker and it's just hard work for me myself mm. I I don't know any shortcuts if I did I'd have monitored it and be a millionaire by now I just don't <laughs> know any shortcuts other than just like regular dedicated work and been lucky enough to stay well enough and fit enough and injury free enough to do it you know you, you know rather than just stacking the miles in one week and then finding you've got shin splints not off for like four weeks afterwards being able to recover quick enough to put the sessions in continually. Um, that's, that's all it is with me. There is no talent. There is no um, particular love of running. I'm not a big uh, kind of lover of running or something. I do it as a, I do it for a purpose. I do it to promote what I believe in, um, which is, you know, a healthy vegan diet and showing the world that you can be healthy on a vegan diet. That's why I really took to running. You are also a runner with a cause. How can people get involved and help out? Well, they can look at my website um, with, you know, it's towerhillstables.com, www.towerhillstables.com. And uh, all the information on the animals that we rescue is on there. Um, And, you know, contact me. Uh, I mean, I would always, you know, if I can offer anyone any advice on, you know, they're worried about, you know, vegetarian diet, going vegan, anything like that. I'm very approachable on Facebook. I always answer people when they write to me, and people write to me from all around the world. Uh, you know, uh, please, you know, if you're interested, just get in touch. It'd be great to hear from you. Um, and, you know, that's through my Facebook, Fiona Oaks on Facebook, or um, 
you know, through, through the Sanctuary website. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Fiona. I wish you the best of luck in your future races, and I appreciate this conversation. Thank you. You're very welcome.